So this lecture is about neurological assessment as well as neurological disorders. Um, some of these are things that you uh, are more of a focus in the pediatric population. Um, some of it is things you've already learned, um, like seizure disorders, for instance. So we'll talk more about how um, in pediatrics, maybe that's a little bit different, some of the stuff that we do, but overall the same. And some of it is an introduction to ICU or, or intensive care type nursing, um, like with intracranial pressure, increased intracranial pressure. That is something that you will see in adults as well as pediatrics, um, but maybe you haven't been introduced to it until you get to med surge too. So that'll be kind of an introduction to that. So as far as your neuro exam, hopefully by now you know how to do a neuro exam on a patient. Um, there are various ways we describe level of consciousness. When we say somebody's alert and oriented, that's what we consider full consciousness. Um, and it progresses on down to, first they usually have some confusion, um, all the way down to persistent vegetative state where they are um, non-communicative. Um, so some of the other things we're looking at, we can look at vital signs. Um, our heart rate, our respiratory rate, um, and we'll talk about um, Cushing's triad in a second with increased intracranial pressure, but your vital signs can reflect um, problems with pressure in the brain. Um, when you have sepsis, your, your heart rate and your respiratory rate go up, your blood pressure goes down, but with Cushing's triad, it's the exact opposite in those vital signs, and that can indicate increasing intracranial pressure. Um, we also want to make sure with neuro exams, um, our blood pressure minimum when, when you do ICU and they are titrating um, blood pressure drips, they often titrate it based on the MAP or the mean arterial pressure being 60. So um, that's kind of the baseline MAP you should have to maintain perfusion to major organs. Um, so some of the other stuff you can look at, skin, eyes, um, motor function, um, if it's coordinated um, posturing. So let's go to the picture next. So you see under posturing, it's listed decorticate um, and decerebrate. This is how you spell those words if you see it on this slide. So the next slide, this um, is a picture of that. So A is decorticate. Um, but you'll also hear it called flexion posturing. Um, so with flexion posturing, that is the cerebral cortex. That's why it's called corticate. It's the cerebral cortex um, versus the bottom one. One, picture B is called the cerebrate and this is you also hear it called extension posturing so um, this is your cerebellum um, and your brain stem um, so it's more dependent on where the problem is um, to where you're gonna see that posturing oftentimes the decerebrate is thought of as more severe because of where it's located if you think about the functions of your brain stem that controls basic bodily functions including maintenance of respirations and heart rate um, so if there's problems in the brain stem you be a little more concerned um, if you are following along on the uploaded PowerPoint on Blackboard with this video and when you get to this picture if you click on that picture within the PowerPoint it will show you a little video um, um, showing posturing and in this video you see where the little boy that's affected um, he's not postured at baseline but then when they stimulate him and move his head it causes him to pull his his hands up into a flexion posturing um, so sometimes depending on the severity of damage um, it may be where they are postured at baseline it may be where they require some kind of stimulation um, to take on that posturing position so going back to neurological examination um, the number one way to determine um, neurological functioning. The most important assessment is level of consciousness, and that's why it's so important that we are assessing that. And a lot of times you just assess it by talking with somebody. If you walk in the room and say, hi, my name is so-and-so, I'm your nurse today, and they're looking at you and they respond, that's full consciousness. We can often gather that um, kind of indirectly. So on page 1357 in your book, it also describes those levels of consciousness. Um, and it's also important to recognize subtle changes. Oftentimes, especially in children, the reason people are so fearful of children often is because children um, often compensate for a very long time. Um, they may have very subtle changes in things like level of consciousness or vital signs that you may not see if you're not assessing them 
and then all of a sudden they crash um, versus adults you see a, a larger progression of decline um, so that can be scary for kids so recognizing those very subtle changes as opposed to um, drastic changes um, is really important in pediatrics so on page 1,358 in your textbook, it shows pictures of eye. So y'all by now know how to assess eye functions, pupil response. Um, we, we measure in size, um, plus two, plus three. Um, we also measure how quickly they constrict, if they're dilated, um, things like that. Um, one thing that's important for you to know is if you have what's called a fixed and dilated pupil where you have a pupil that is very large it doesn't constrict um, most commonly it's going to be one side or the other um, unilateral not both but this is a neurosurgical emergency this has to do with increased intracranial pressure and what happens with that is where that brain stem is starting to herniate through, or, or about to herniate so the brain stem hasn't um, herniated yet um, if the pressure gets so high it begins to it will cause brainstem herniation and you cannot survive brainstem herniation um, so if that happens it is a emergency they need to get to an OR right away to relieve that pressure in their head um, because that's what's causing it you you're your skull inside is a fixed space so when you have things that change in amount like you have increased fluid or bleeding or swelling of the brain tissue something's got to give um, there, there's no room for it to expand um, so it's going to start pushing things out of that occipital opening and that's what happens when you have a fixed and dilated pupil so big emergency if that happens so when we're talking about coma assessment so coma um, the, the Glasgow Coma Scale is what we use. It's the gold standard. Um, some of you may have heard of this in use with adults. Um, it is no different the scoring in adults versus pediatrics. The only thing that's really different about the pediatric Glasgow Coma Scale versus the adults is how you measure the verbal response. So in an infant, you can't really say they're oriented because you can't ask them orientation questions. So if they are having appropriate language skills, like for instance, a younger infant is cooing and babbling, um, that's considered a normal um, verbal function for them. Um, so the scores are the same. It's just the way we score that verbal response based on their, their developmental level. Um, so you should know what three parts we are assessing in the pediatric Glasgow Coma Scale or the Glasgow Coma Scale in general because it's the same again with adults. Eye opening, verbal response, motor response. Um, so if you say, what is your name? And they respond back with, my name is Joe Schmo. Um, well, and they're looking at you. You got all three scored very well. So the top number you can get is a score of 15. Um, this means you're totally alert and oriented um, and the lowest you can get in three and this is somebody who's completely obtunded and unresponsive so one saying we have in emergency medicine is less than eight in debate and what this means is once they get to a score of eight they can no longer maintain their airway so you get concerned um, with uh, respiratory arrest and, and going into a very deep um, um, emergency situation. So on page 1357 in your textbook, it does talk, it gives you an example of how to score these. I do not expect you to memorize the Glasgow Coma Scale and provide a analysis of a score, but you should know the parts that you're looking for when you're assessing that Glasgow Coma Scale. So one problem we may see in both children and adults is increased intracranial pressure. There are various reasons this can happen. A lot of times we think of head injuries as causing this, which it absolutely can. It can be either from blood building up or it can be from cerebral swelling, whatever the cause. Um, think again the skull is a fixed structure in infants where their skull has not fused together the sutures haven't fused together you have a little bit of wiggle room and that's where they'll get like the bulging fontanelle and all but in an adult or a child that's old enough that their sutures have fused together you don't have any give um so when one increases 
one, you have CSF, you have blood, and you have brain tissue. When one of those components increases, something else has to decrease to accommodate it. So when you have, for instance, bleeding in the brain, the tissue of the brain is going to get compressed to accommodate that, and that's where you start getting some of those symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. Um, so oftentimes the symptoms will be vague to begin with. They might just be a little bit listless. Um, they might be um, tired, whatever it be. They might be just irritable. Um, and then those symptoms will progress potentially rapidly depending on the severity. On page 1356, it does outline the symptoms and you should know the difference between symptoms in an infant versus symptoms in an older child. So think of the difference is if it requires the child to be able to tell you the symptoms, then that is not a symptom in an infant. So some of the symptoms you see in both groups, um, you see vomiting. Vomiting is pretty common for increased intracranial pressure as it gets higher. Um, you may also see irritability at first and then lethargy. Um, in older children, you may see behavioral changes. Um, sometimes it is not always obvious. Sometimes it's just where they're um, maybe a little bit more needy or a little bit more irritable. Um, and, and again, they can be very subtle. Um, also in older children, you may see where they're complaining of a headache or photophobia, where they have um, pain with lights, or phonophobia, where they have increased pain with, with sound. Um, so then in infants, you may see that high-pitched cry, like that cry we talked about um, with with opioid withdrawal that can also cause that high pitched cry um, when they have increased intracranial pressure they can have poor feeding um, if they've still got an open fontanelle they may have a bulging fontanelle so looking for those differences in signs of infants versus older children but some of them are the same so how do we treat increased intracranial pressure? Well, the simple answer is you, you treat whatever is causing it. Um, so if there is a brain bleed, you may have to drill a hole, what's called a burr hole, a B-U-R-R, -R, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's where they take a drill, drill a hole through the skull so blood that's building up can drain out. Um, if it is tissue that is swelling. Um, our number one drug that we give for cerebral edema is mannitol. Mannitol um, helps by um, moving fluid out of that brain tissue. Um, a second drug we may use is hypertonic saline. If you go back to med surge one, um, when you talked about hypotonic, hypertonic fluids, hypertonic fluids pull fluids into the vasculature. So it will pull fluids um, out of all the tissues. Um, the problem with hypertonic saline is it's not specific to the brain. The mannitol is more specific to cerebral tissue. Um, so when you use hypertonic saline, you have the potential to draw too much fluid out of the systemic cells as a whole. Um, so that's kind of a second line of treatment, but mannitol, number one drug that we use for um, increased intracranial pressure related to cerebral edema. So symptoms, um, I've mentioned some of the symptoms. So changes in level of consciousness, changes um, in in irritability, um, when it gets severe, they may start having those pupil changes, that fixed and dilated pupil that's a neurosurgical emergency. Um, the in infants bulging fontanelles, that high pitched cry, vomiting in both groups. Um, but I mentioned already Cushing's triad that you see at the top. So vital sign changes um, typically are not going to be your first thing. If you start seeing vital sign changes related to increased intracranial pressure, this is pretty serious. These are later signs. So think of Cushing's triad exactly the opposite of shock or sepsis. So in sepsis and shock, we have decreased blood pressure increased pulse and respirations, but in increased intracranial pressure, it's the exact opposite. Your heart rate and your respiratory rate decrease, blood pressure increases. So exactly the opposite. Um, so monitoring for those symptoms um, and knowing what to do about it. So how do we take care of these patients other than treating the cause? So a big, big thing with patients with increased intracranial pressure is stimulation. You want to minimize as much stimulation as possible. So one of the big issues 
with patients that have increased intracranial pressure related and stimulation related to that is suctioning. Um, when it's severe, oftentimes these patients are going to be intubated and sedated, um, and, and they're going to need suctioning, but making sure that you're avoiding over suctioning because not only is that going to irritate the airway, but it can make that increased pressure worse. Eliminating as much noise as possible, making sure you have the head of the pet elevated at least 30 degrees. Um, these are not patients you want flat or in Trendelenburg because think of what happens when you lay down and you have a headache. It feels like it increases that pressure and it's just going to make it worse. Avoidance of overhydration. When you overhydrate, you're adding more fluid to the problem potentially. So very greatly focusing on eyes and O's. Um, they are on very strict eyes and O's even if they don't need it for urinary purposes. Oftentimes they'll have a Foley just to monitor um, that output very specifically. And then thermoregulation as well. Um, so with thermoregulation, think about what's in your brain. You have your hypothalamus. If something is pressing on that, um, then it's not going to function correctly. So when you have impaired functioning of that hypothalamus, it can cause their temperature to go up and down. So oftentimes these patients will be either on a bear hugger um, because they're dropping their temp, which is actually more likely, or sometimes they'll be on a cooling blanket because they're, they're increasing that temp too much. Um, making sure we're, we're controlling patients pain management, that's another stimulation. And just if they're intubated and sedated, sometimes that can be hard to determine pain um, if they're, they're sedated. So uh, monitoring things like vital signs can give you a really good indicator of pain. Um, when we're talking about somebody who has increased intracranial pressure, decreased consciousness, we can't rely on previous experiences with pain to um, to determine how we're going to treat it. Oftentimes with patients that have head injuries, um, we have to be very careful what pain medicines we give them. Oftentimes Tylenol, unless they're intubated and sedated, Tylenol is the only thing we can really administer to them because if you think about NSAIDs and what happens, NSAIDs increases bleeding. If you have a head bleed or you even have the potential for a head bleed, like if you have a concussion, you want to avoid NSAIDs. Um, opioids. Opioids are great except for um, um, it, it, it would make you sleepy potentially or drowsy and if the patient is drowsy are they drowsy because of the opioid or are they drowsy because their pressure in their head is getting worse um, so typically you will involve the, the provider um, to determine um, the best method of pain management you can't really do an accurate pain assessment like with a numeric or a faces on a patient who is um, has decreased level of consciousness it's not going to be an accurate assessment um, in the same way so making sure that um, you're monitoring and treating that pain that can be a, a high source of stimulation for those patients so one common cause of Increased intracranial pressure is cerebral trauma or head trauma. Um, we, we've already talked about one of the major causes of death and injury in children is accidents. And again, this, this varies depending on the age and the growth and development of the patient. Usually younger children are fall related. Um, your, your school age and all are more like sports, bicycle injuries, outdoor play, that kind of stuff. Um, and then your adolescents are your motor vehicle accidents accidents. So there's various injuries they can get. They can get skull fractures, which may or may not be concerning depending on the location of the skull fracture, depending on if it's depressed or not. You can have a skull fracture where it's just a crack in the skull um, and it will heal on its own. But if it's depressed where it's pushing into that tissue, that would be obviously more concerning. If you have a basal or skull fracture where there's a um, fracture in the skull, um, of the bone that separate your pharyngeal cavity and your brain cavity, um, that can be concerning as well because that can potentially cause some trauma um, related to trying to care for the patient. Um, so cerebral trauma typically is related to some kind of force either causing a bleed or causing swelling like shaken baby for instance you might not have a bleed but that constant hitting of that brain against that scalp causes swelling. It's just like if you hit your arm on a table over and over again, it's going to swell even if it's not broken. Um, and same thing goes with that brain tissue. It's going to swell from being hit. Um, so various different things that can cause this. Um, there are 
bleeds, there is cerebral trauma. Um, but how do we know warning signs versus um, not warning signs? So we'll talk about concussions in a minute. But your big warning signs after any kind of head injury is changes in level of consciousness. Now, a lot of times kids will, will be, feel drowsy after these situations. Drowsy is okay as long as they are arousable. So it used to be parents were taught to wake their children every two hours, um, fully awaken them or keep them up all night even. We don't really do that anymore. Um, typically, if you can arouse them enough that they're responsive, that's good enough. Um, but if they're becoming where they're more difficult to arouse, they can have seizures from head injuries. The video we watched of Joshua Barron, that's exactly what happened. His head trauma from the accident is what caused him to have seizures. Um, the bleeding or watery drainage from the nose or ears, that's that basal or skull fracture I was talking about, that, that bone that separates the pharyngeal cavity from the brain cavity. There's a fracture there. You can have cerebral spinal fluid draining into the nose or into the ears um, and the way you would diagnose that how you would know if it's just nasal mucus drainage versus CSF draining into their nose is you test it for glucose um, typically nasal drainage is not going to have glucose in it but cerebrospinal fluid does so it, you can just test it on a glucometer like you would test somebody's um, blood sugar on their finger and it will come up um, high if it's CSF. Um, so pupil changes. Sometimes they start out subtle where they're just um, slow to respond and then it becomes that fixed and dilated pupil. Um, any of these projectile vomiting. So clinical findings are discussed on 1,367. Oftentimes, the very first one you see is changes in level of consciousness. And again, they're usually subtle in the beginning. It might just be where they're a little drowsy. So um, you keep an eye on that. Then they might start saying things that uh, seem like confusion. So when we talk about priority assessments in a head injury patient, um, when if you go to the ER, you'll take a class called trauma, TNCC, Trauma Nursing Certification. And we actually do, you learn about ABCs in school, but we go all the way down to P with how you assess um, your patient um, in your order of assessment. So you've got your ABCs, your airway, breathing, circulation. Well, then D is what stands for disability. And this is your neuro status. This includes spinal um, as well as head. So when after you know they have ABCs in place, they're breathing and everything and circulating, then you go to is the, is their spine stabilized? What's their neuro status? So it helps you identify that comes right after those ABCs. So one form of head injury is a concussion. Concussion is kind of a vague word. What does concussion mean? Most people um, don't exactly know how to describe. So it is essentially like a bruising on the brain. Um, usually you can't see it um, on CT unless it's pretty severe. So they're not necessarily going to do a CT for a concussion or if they do, um, they might just treat for it even if they don't see anything. But um, typically treatment and diagnosis is based on symptoms. Um, we have a scale that we use, um, a form that we have them fill out where they um, fill in their symptoms on like a Likert scale um, and then you use that to assess the severity. Um, the most common symptom we see of concussion is headache. Um, so headaches are very common. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a concussion, but especially if it goes on. So um, concussions are Oftentimes they side on the side of safety and will diagnose people with concussions just to be sure, um, especially your sports injury people. Um, they have gotten very, very particular about concussions in sports. If you play sports or, or you have children that do or know people that do, they're very, very picky about these and they should be. Um, the reason concussions have become such a big deal in sports is because if you suffer a concussion before you have finished recovering from the first one, it can cause pretty much immediate death. The severity of the trauma to the head um, can kill you. Um, so it is very important if they are going to play that they have fully recovered. Um, typically, they say you've recovered when you have seven consecutive full days without symptoms. Um, the problem is if you have symptoms that are just reportable symptoms, like a headache, for instance, <clears throat> 
and you have a teenager that really wants to play their sport, um, many times they're going to try and hide that headache because like we've talked about, adolescents are invincible. Nothing can happen to them. And if they are determined they want to play that sport, they will hide that headache, um, not understanding the ramifications of their decision. Um, so that can make it tough too. But um, doctors typically will not clear and a lot of coaches will not allow patients to play or until they've been cleared by a physician. Um, they can have symptoms, some more subtle symptoms for months. Um, patients that have more severe um, concussions can have problems with focusing in school um, and drowsiness and things like that. So it, it can be difficult with concussions to really determine not only um, the severity, but also um, the resolution of it. So some complications of head trauma oftentimes could be a bleed. Um, not often, but um, you can have a bleed, and there's two kind of main ones. Um, symptoms of head trauma, um, there's a box on 1367. Oftentimes, again, they start with drowsiness, sleepiness, um, may progress to vomiting, vital sign changes, um, changes in um, having seizures, things like that. So monitoring for those things. So you have two kind of main types of bleeds that you can get in, in the head. Um, you'll hear it called either a hematoma or a hemorrhage. Um, it means the same thing. It's just a collection of blood. So epidural hematomas are going to kill you faster. Um, subdural hematomas you can still die from, but it's a slower progression. So with an epidural hematoma, you see those more often in children. Um, subdural hematomas you see more often in adults. Um, epidural hematomas are a bleed um, that is arterial based. And if you look at the picture, the epidural hematoma is the one at the top. It collects more locally um, and it can cause that brain tissue to shift. Um, versus a subdural hematoma is venous and it spreads out kind of more. So um, if you have somebody say on blood thinners, for instance, it could bleed, uh, it's slower bleeding, but if it's not caught and being that it's slower bleeding, the symptoms are gonna be more subtle. Um, so it may go missed and continue bleed over several days. Um, with an epidural hematoma, they happen more rapidly within a couple hours. So I had a seven year old one time a couple years ago in the ER where he came in because him and a friend of his were playing outside, riding their scooters, didn't have helmets on, and they kind of collided with each other, um, and then his head hit the ground. We don't know if he lost consciousness because his friend that was with him ran off to go get the child's parents. Um, when the child's parents got there, he was conscious, so not sure if he actually lost consciousness, um, but the parents got him together. He looked okay, so they went out to eat, and he started vomiting. Um, by the time we, when I saw him come into the ER, he was walking, talking, acting relatively normal, just had a headache and didn't seem to um, feel too good. By the time within 45 minutes, by the time we got his head CT, um, saw he had an epidural bleed and called VCU to get him an emergency transport. He had grown um, to where he was barely responsive. He didn't even jerk away trying to start an IV. His pupils were sluggish, um, so it can progress that rapidly. The good news is if you want the good end of the story, they did get this child to um, BCU in the OR and they were able to drain the blood and he had no long-term side effects. Um, so it worked out well, but you can see how if he hadn't been where he was when he started to decline so rapidly, it could have been a very, very different outcome. So um, that's your, your bleeds. You can also get cerebral edema, just swelling of the tissue itself, uh, which puts pressure on that tissue. The more it swells, the more think of like compartment syndrome as it, as it swells, it compresses other structures. Um, and then brain herniation. Again, if, if the compression is so high, uh, that tissue's got to go somewhere. It, it, can't keep pushing against the skull. It's not going to break the skull. The skull is too hard, so it's going to start compressing out of that occipital opening in the back, causing a brain herniation, which one of the ways you would identify that is a um, 
a fixed and dilated pupil where you have a pupil that is very large um, and unresponsive to light. Um, you'll also hear it called a blown pupil. So if you hear of a blown pupil, that's what they're referring to. Um, this is a neurosurgical emergency. They have to get to the OR to drain blood or whatever is causing this problem. If you see the picture, um, what's called a craniotomy, the picture on the right, this is where they take a flap of the bone out. So this is an effective method for cerebral edema. If they have swelling of the tissue and there's nothing to drain, they will take a portion of the skull out. Um, they actually have freezers in the OR where they store the bone flap. Um, over weeks or how much time it takes for that swelling to go down and then go and put it back in. Um, but that's one way that it allows a space for that tissue to expand. So how do we manage head trauma? Well, our first um, priority is to decrease that pressure. Um, we want to, whether it be creating a burr hole to drain blood, whether it be doing the craniotomy, we need to get that pressure minimized. On page 1368, it talks about emergency treatment. Again, as the nurse, your assessment is going to, and interventions are going to follow A, B, C, D. Airway breathing circulation is always first. Um, if they are not breathing, then your spinal assessment and your neuro assessment really doesn't matter at that point. Um, so once you get ABC squared away, then you go to D, your disability. So assessing their neuro status, stabilizing their spine, all those things that we do. Again, as far as pain management, we need to talk with the provider to determine an appropriate pain management regimen. You can't focus on previously used methods of assessment or you can't focus on previous experiences with assessment in a patient who has impaired um, neurological functioning. Um, typically, Tylenol is going to be the drug of choice because it's going to have the least amount of side effects related to this person's problem. So, moving away from head trauma, we'll talk about some of the infectious ones. Meningitis, bacterial meningitis. I know you've talked about this in med surge one um, so the one we really worry about is bacterial meningitis this is the one people get hospitalized for this is the one that people get treated for this is the one that people get put on precautions for so remember meningitis even though it's a brain and meningeal infection of the the brain coverings it is spread by respiratory so this is droplet precautions um, as far as remembering your precautions um, for airborne, think MTV, like, you know, the TV channel, measles, tuberculosis, varicella. Um, as far as droplet, that is going to be your other respiratory agents. Um, if you look and see the, the bacterial agents that cause bacterial meningitis um, the, that are listed on your screen, things like strep, you can get a strep infection that migrates to the meninges. Um, all of the staff. Um, so things that can start as respiratory infections can migrate. Sinus infections can cause it. So it is spread by respiratory. Um, and then your um, contact is going to be typically your skin and your um, GI along with RSV because RSV has to be different. <laughs> um, so on page 1373, it talks about your symptoms of bacterial meningitis. You'll see a lot of these um, neurological problems uh, have very similar symptoms. So bacterial meningitis has very similar symptoms to a head trauma. Um, they'll often start having um, decreased level of consciousness. Vomiting is a big um, symptom we see associated with meningitis. Um, but the hallmark symptom related to meningitis that would differentiate that for you. Um, fever is a big one with head trauma. You, you may have thermoregulation issues, but it's not going to be a fever related to prostaglandin release, but your big hallmark symptom you should know related to meningitis is nuchal rigidity, um, that neck rigidity. That is a big symptom that makes a difference. One of the doctors I worked with at KidMed, her kid had been sick for three or four days. Um, she figured it was just a virus, high fevers, like 103, 104, kind of maintenance, you know, care. When he came down one morning and said, Mom, my neck hurts. She knew, oh my goodness, this is more serious than just, 
um, a run-of-the-mill flu or virus or whatever. Um, so that nuchal rigidity is that big symptom you see. Um, they'll get other symptoms like you see with um, increased intracranial pressure. Oftentimes they have a headache. Um, they'll oftentimes have um, photophobia and phonophobia um, in infants they may have the high-pitched cry and and the impaired eating and with all groups they may have vomiting in fact vomiting is very common because of that increased intracranial pressure um, so again bacterial is the one that's most serious that's why we focus on it so your priority and this goes for any patient who is potentially infectious and you're seeing that right now with everything that's going on um, is isolation. That is your priority, period. Any patient that even has the potential to be infectious, isolating that patient to whatever manner they need to be isolated, depending on their infection, um, they need to be isolated because you want to prevent the spread to others. That is your priority to protect the population. Um, other interventions. You want to, um, for this, we do give antibiotics. It's bacterial meningitis. If it's viral, we don't. But bacterial meningitis, we do give antibiotics. Very frequent neuro checks, usually a minimum of every two hours. Um, decreasing stimuli, just like with the head injury, we want to decrease that stimuli. We don't want them to be overworked, um, which can increase that pressure in that head. Um, and monitoring for progression of symptoms. So here is an example of the symptoms. Um, so you see Koenig sign and Brzezinski sign. So Koenig sign is where um, when the child lays on their back, if you flex at the hip, you can't extend that leg all the way straight at the knee. Um, and then with the Brzezinski sign, if you as the provider push their neck up because of that meningeal irritation and, and that um, nuchal rigidity that impaired flexion um, if you push their head towards down their chin down towards their chest it automatically draws their legs up um, involuntarily so you see the other symptoms there oftentimes have a pretty high fever 103 104 vomiting um, may have some confusion um, the the picture up at the top um, right isn't I put that there for a reason because it's especially in children you often see a rash with men, meningitis it's it just like a popular rash um, and it is not itchy or anything like that but that can also be a, a good indicator of a um, of an infection of a meningitis infection so again, how we treat it, um, we diagnose by a lumbar puncture. Um, so this is where we put a needle, like the picture you see there, um, into the spinal column where the, the into the to withdraw CSF. Um, and this will we can get a culture from this. We can see if there is bacteria. We can see if there's there's um, white blood cells, things like that. So. Again, priority intervention is to isolate them and, and treat any symptoms that they may have, um, especially associated with that increased intracranial pressure. So, so the next thing you really only hear about in the pediatric population, this is our big thing we associate with aspirin. So this is your rise syndrome. This is why we don't give aspirin to children except under very specific circumstances. So rise syndrome, even though it's because it affects the liver that they have the symptoms, it's a neurological problem because of the ammonia and all that builds up on the brain related to the liver failure is where they get their symptoms. So even though it's a liver failure, related to that aspirin administration it is neurological symptoms that you're going to see um, and that's why it we are talking about this under neurological so this is where um again um that in it, it happens when they take aspirin if they have influenza or varicella is where it has been connected with now especially with influenza we don't always test our children so just because they are let's say they have cold symptoms and you say oh it can't be the flu it could be same thing with varicella especially now that we are immunizing more and more um 
sometimes those illnesses like influenza and varicella can have a little bit milder symptoms. So just because they don't have a fever doesn't mean they don't have the flu. Um, so it has been taught across in pediatrics, never give aspirin to children unless you're specifically told to for things like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and Kawasaki's disease we'll talk about in cardiac. So some very specific reasons we will give aspirin in children, but as an overall blanket statement, children should never receive aspirin because of this. So again, the the combination of the flu and the varicella inter, having that um, virus in their body interacting with that aspirin causes a liver impairment or liver failure, temporary liver failure. Um, and when that liver impairment happens, it's not breaking down the ammonia. So ammonia is a byproduct of the proteins we eat, um, which normally we are able to break down in our liver and, and digest and metabolize and, and excrete. Um, but with that liver not processing those proteins correctly, there's too much ammonia that builds up. And when it builds up, it collects on the brain, causing a brain inflammation and encephalopathy. And that's where we get our symptoms related to it. So it causes, um, again, the same symptoms you would see with the increased intracranial pressure, the meningitis, those typical symptoms, the vomiting, the lethargy, the vital sign changes, all of those things that we can get. So as far as treatment, treatment is aggressive supportive therapy. So there's not really a treatment as far as a specific treatment, but um, oftentimes they have to get in it intubated and just closely, closely monitoring those vital signs and intake and output um, just to to monitor them um, and make sure they, they pull through it. And most of the time they do. Usually they recover well, um, but it's a pretty extensive recovery period. And oftentimes children have permanent cognitive delays related to it so it's not completely 100 percent cured the the infection the reaction is in the sense of they're not um gonna die but they can have permanent impairment due to it um so we rarely see rise syndrome anymore for two reasons one are again our immunization um increased immunizations now that we immunize against varicella which when i was a child there was no immunization so um there's that there's immunizations more readily available for influenza as well um and the second piece to reason we're pretty much not seeing this anymore is the education of the public most people even if they don't know why they know not to give children aspirin products. Um, so education of the public as well as increased immunizations have greatly led to a rapid decline of this um, reaction and you rarely, rarely see it, but it's very important to, to know how to prevent that because there's potential long-term complications associated with it. So one thing you probably know a lot about that I know you've covered in med surge um, is seizures. Um, seizures can happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they are idiopathic, and oftentimes those are the people that um, get labeled with a, what we'll call a seizure disorder or epilepsy. Um, and sometimes it has a very specific cause. If you have a brain tumor, that can cause seizure disorders. If you have um, a head injury, that can cause seizure disorders. If you have um, impaired electrolytes, um, like talking about with the infants, we don't give infants water because it can drop their sodium, and the end result could be a potential seizure because of that. So various reasons children have seizures and adults as well. So on page 1378, there is a chart that shows um, causes of acute versus chronic seizures. Um, when we're talking about during the seizure itself, the big focus, as you know, is safety, making sure that everything that the patient could harm themselves on is moved out of the way. You don't want to restrain the patient. You can actually break their bones trying to restrain them in a tonic clonic seizure situation because of the force of the rigidity. Um, you want to turn them on their side in case they vomit. Don't put anything in their mouth. Hopefully, y'all know all of this care already. So when we're talking about classifications, again, you've talked about this before. You might want to review. Generalized includes the whole brain. Um, partial is a portion of the brain. So they might just have like a tick um, or something like that. Um, but partial can lead to generalized. 
So if you're following along on the PowerPoint, um, you see there are two links. There's a link where it says tonic clonic and there's a link where it says absence if you'd like to see those videos um, so that you can see the difference in tonic clonic. Tonic clonic is what most people think of when they think of a seizure. Um, so the, the jerking repetitive kind of movements. Um, you'll also hear grand mal seizures, although that is kind of an old terminology. We don't really use that term anymore, but if you ever hear of a grand mal seizure, that's what they're talking about versus an absent seizure you'll also hear called pettit mall seizure um, again kind of old terminology we don't really use anymore but occasionally you do hear it um, so with your tonic clonic it's the jerking movements with absent seizure this is more of a staring type episode um, sometimes these can be difficult to diagnose the teacher might just report that the child's not paying attention in class um, or things like that and really what it is is they're having a seizure um, they typically don't last very long they might last 10 seconds so you think the child is just daydreaming or zoning out for 10 seconds and they're back and oh what were we talking about um so it, it can be hard to really um notice that the, that's what's going on but it's a seizure it's still is having the brain going haywire just like a tonic clonic seizure um the one you haven't covered before probably in med surge is febrile seizures um so febrile seizures is only in children um typically febrile seizures will disappear by the age of five um it's very unusual to have them after that age um, they do seem to have a genetic component um, people who are susceptible to them it's not where everybody gets a febrile seizure but there are certain people that are susceptible to them typically um, when you have one child that has them it's more likely a sibling will have them as well um, when a child has already had them it's more likely they're going to have them again so there's really no treatment for febrile seizures. We don't put them on anti-seizure medications. We don't give Ativan or things like that when they're having the seizure because they self-resolve typically. Um, so the big thing with febrile seizures is it's not how high the temperature gets. Oftentimes that's a mis, um, misunderstanding about people think it, a certain level of temperature is going to cause a seizure. Um, febrile seizures are more caused by how fast it goes up. Um, so the rate of climb. So you can have a febrile seizure at 100 just as well as 102. Um, depending on how rapidly that that temperature increases. Um, this is also a reason we don't um, use the same treatment measures we used to for fevers. Um, it used to be for children that had high fevers, we would wipe them down with alcohol or put them in a cool bath, um, but that cools them too quickly, which can also cause a febrile seizure, the, the rate of decline of the temperature as well. So really giving acetaminophen and ibuprofen, um, taking extra heavy clothes off, things like that are the the best treatment methods and just waiting it out um, don't really want to make it too fast so with febrile seizures there, there's no there's no treatment for it other than just like you would when a ch any child is having or any a patient in general is having a seizure um, maintaining safety but no no treatment other than that so when we're talking about children that have seizure disorders where they have repetitive seizures not febrile seizures um, then oftentimes they are put on some kind of anti-epileptic therapy. Um, Depakote is a very common one that we use in pediatrics as well as phenytoin um, or dilantin. Um, so it's it's often very hard to manage seizures, kind of like with psychiatric disorders and neuro disorders. Um, there are lots of drugs on the market. There's lots of uh, doses. Oftentimes these medications don't kick in in a few days. It can take weeks to kick in. Um, so they are battling trying to figure out what the appropriate dose and what the appropriate meds are. And they're usually on two or three medications. It's not just one medication to manage this. So figuring out that sweet spot of medication combinations to, to decrease their or hopefully eliminate their seizure activity um, can take a while to get there. So drug therapy is often the primary um means of control and prevention um, ketogenic diets have been found to be um, responsive to this you see ketogenic diets not just as a fad for weight loss but for a lot of especially neurological and psychiatric disorders you're seeing positive things with patients with autism um, using ketogenic diets um, and seizure disorders and, and decreasing their situations because it puts them in a permanent 
state of acidosis. Um, if medications don't work, they can do what's called a vagus nerve stimulator, which is an implanted device in the, in, uh, in the neck. And it, it wraps around the vagus nerve, and then the patient may have a device um, that is like a magnet. When they're having a seizure, somebody that's with them can place that magnet um, over the implanted device, and it stimulates it to uh, to irritate the vagus nerve and stop the seizure. Um, you're also seeing ones um, nowadays that are self-activating as well, where you don't need that external device to place on it, but it will recognize the patient's having a seizure and automatically activate, kind of like an, an implanted AED. So um, they're getting more and more advanced in that way, and you don't have to have somebody with you. Um, sometimes surgery is necess necessary. I've had um, I had a four-year-old one time who had to have an entire hemisphere of their brain taken out because of their seizures were so severe and so frequent um, and nothing else was helping. So that's that's pretty drastic. That's not very typical, um, but sometimes it does need drastic measures. Um, so on page 1383, it does talk about seizure precautions. Hopefully, again, this is something you know. This doesn't change with pediatrics. Um, same thing, keeping the, the bed rails padded, making sure um, that they have somebody with them when they get up, stuff like that, just to make sure they're safe. So can children outgrow seizure disorders? Absolutely they can. You have children that may have a seizure disorder for a few years um, and then they're able to come off those medications and not um, continue to suffer from those seizures. Um, so how do we know when they're ready to come off those meds? So you should know the, the best way to discontinue meds, they need to be two years consecutively seizure-free. Never had a seizure in two years. Um, that's the first requirement. And then once they are taken off, it's in a tapered fashion. They're not just going to stop it because you can actually cause a seizure that way. So tapered fashion after two years seizure-free. So this we have already talked about back um, when we did newborns, hydrocephalus. There's various different reasons for hydrocephalus. This is where you have a buildup of CSF in the brain. It could be where the ventricles aren't functioning properly for drainage. Um, sometimes the, the, the translation of hydrocephalus is waterhead. Um, so this is where they have that buildup of water. If their sutures haven't fused together yet, it can get pretty severe and they can get pretty large heads. So that's why in infants, we will measure head circumference up till the age of two, um, because it, if you're seeing significant changes, that could indicate anything from hydrocephalus to a brain tumor. So on page 1389, you see those manifestations again. The manifestations are very similar to um, other head injury and infection manifestations, um, especially if it rapidly increases. Um, so what do we do about hydrocephalus if it's if it's like a congenital hydrocephalus or even acquired um, things like shaken baby syndrome can cause disruptions in those ventricles being able to drain um, and can cause this as well. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. And so what are we going to do about it? Well, we got to get the fluid out. So this is where we'll do a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, or you'll call it a VP shunt. So this is where you have a tube um, that is snaked down. This is under the skin. It's snaked down the neck, um, and it ends in the peritoneal space and allows an area for that fluid to drain. Oftentimes, these patients need multiple revisions um, because of growth. As they get bigger, they need a longer tube, um, and infections, they can become separated, disconnected. Um, so patients that have, you know, if you had a child that had a headache, you might say take some Tylenol. You got a patient with a VP shunt who has a headache, they need to go to the ER. So their, those symptoms will be much more greatly um, monitored in those patients. Um, you should know your post-op care of these patients. So post-op care of these patients, decreasing stimulation, making sure they're at at least a 30 degree angle, measuring abdominal girth. As that fluid builds up, you want to make sure it's not building up too much and causing um, peritoneal swelling, things like that. Um, monitoring vital signs, neurostatus. Um, and here is just some pictures. So this is sometimes we externalize that VP shunt um, and have it on the outside where we can give medications um, and such. Um, as you know, the blood brain barrier is great about keeping things out of the brain um, that we don't want, but it's also good about keeping things out of the brain we do want. So sometimes um, 
shunt infections and neurological infections can be hard to treat because um, of the blood brain barrier. So with that VP shunt on the outside, we can have it just directly um, put infuse the drugs right into it, let it dwell into the ventricles and drain back out. And that allows more direct treatment and more effective treatment of um, those shunt infections.